Security context, DLLs and modules and memories, right? DLLs, dynamic link libraries, gotta love them. Uh, anybody ever go into Windows System 32 and look at your DLLs? How many are there? <laughs> if I add one in there, would you ever be able to tell? Nope. Exactly. Uh, that's what hackers try to do, try to inject DLLs. You see DLL injection all the time, right? Okay. Windows, here we go. Windows. Yeah. The how, wrong button. How, hardware abstraction layer allows us to talk to the hardware with the microkernel and all that good stuff, yeah? Not going to spend too much on the architecture here. There's one important thing to note. See how you're in user mode here and you're in kernel mode here? Yeah? Well, kernel mode's where? In the kernel. Oh, duh, Kevin. Huh? But you either got user mode or you got kernel mode. This is a problem because of the way Windows did its implementation of the kernel. And we call it a broken kernel. I did this at Microsoft at their secure development lifecycle one time. They didn't ask me back after that, but anyway, I put up a slide and said, your kernel's broken. And it is, because there's four rings in the Intel architecture. Ring zero is kernel mode, they're in the middle. Ring three is user mode. Well, what about ring one and ring two? They didn't use it. So you're telling me I'm either in kernel mode or I'm in user mode. So that means anything I do that requires kernel mode has to be at the lowest level of the operating system. Welcome to the world of why we have so much malware and root kits today. Okay? Linux did the same thing. But Linux did it a little bit different. Anybody know what Linux did different? They don't run everything down here under the sun in kernel mode. All right? If the process isn't running in kernel mode, I can't get into kernel mode without forcing a privilege escalation. All right? But Windows runs pretty much everything in kernel mode. Huh? Finally, SQL Server 2008 does not run in kernel mode. So if you come to the Advanced Network Defense course, we're going to show you how to secure SQL Server 2005. And if you can do it, SQL Server 2008 is about as tight as you can get in the Microsoft SQL world. Right? That's really the protection for you today. Right? Now, anybody heard of Jamie Butler? Yeah, Jamie Butler said, hey, Microsoft, why didn't you put device drivers in ring one and maybe something else in ring two for protection? Yeah? And Jamie Butler, a well-known software engineer, if you know him, he said, hmm, you didn't do that, so I'm going to write a tool to show you what is bad about that. And he wrote the first, what we call a DCOM. Remember your DCOM? Direct Kernel Object Manipulation Rootkit. Yeah. Uh, you uh, remember the year that right? Jamie Those Butler released and so showed the rootkit called for, FU? Something out of the normal, right? So when you get on the box, remember your netstat, your route command, and your NS lookup. You can do a netstat dash R. What's dash R? Rowdy. Yeah. Well, this is really good because what if the box is multi-homed and has more than one network connected to it? Anybody doing security testing knows we're usually limited to our scope of work. But what if you get on a box and it's got another uh, network card? What do we have to do? We got to go to the client and say, hey, there's another network card here. Can I test that network too? Huh? That one's another one that these top red teams all around the world, when I get to run them in a class, they all miss. There will be another network hidden, an entire hidden network. They'll be on the box, exploited it, and having fun, and they'll forget to look at netstat-r or the route command and see there's an entire another network that's hidden that they could have backdoored into and they didn't even know it was there. Okay? Again, things to think about. Okay, so what do we try to do? We try to compromise a host. So if we're out here in the outside world, all right, there we are hacking out in the outside world in the Internet cloud, and we're going to try to get in hops. Yeah? And each level is a different hop. And we used to have contests when I ran the red team for the Navy uh, out in England. We had contests at five hops. If you get five hops, you usually were in a pretty good position. Right? And this is old school when it was fun before everybody started putting in IPS and all this other stuff. Where now we got the client side. Huh? So each point I get into is another point. And what do I do? I pivot. We call it an island hop. So each one's an island hop in. And then I pivot into the network from there. Why do I set the sources that compromise host? Trust. Why do we have the problems we have in networks today? Trust. Right? This is what I love to do. Who invented TCP IP? Department of Defense. Dr. Vinton served Dr. Robert Kahn, right? Two guys. What year? 1972, I think it was ratified. 71, 72, good. What was the size of the Internet in 1972? We just use general terms, small. What's the size of the internet today? We don't even know what the size is. What's the protocol still running it? T 
TCPIP, let's see, hmm, 1972, I don't know what year are we in, 2011? What is that, 39 years? And we're still running the same protocol? And that protocol was developed to be on a network that was trusted and small? So we always have these trust relationships, right? And those of you who've done any Windows admin, you know, a client comes in and says, hey, we've got a merger, we're doing an acquisition. We need to talk to these other people. So what do you do? Set up a trust relationship. That's exactly how we hack, right? Different things. So every point I get in here, I literally get another position and a pivot point that shows me a different part of the network. Right? And with Metasploit and Meterpreter and all that type of stuff, I can hack this box in here, right? one of these, and I can load Meterpreter and Metasploit on that box. And then use that box as an exploit proxy and keep just exploiting everybody from that machine. Okay? You do it in a lot of the pen testing courses. We did it in the advanced pen testing course too. Again, it's that concept of once you have access, pivot and try to get further, deeper access. Okay. And that's all we do now is we just go deeper into the network. Once we have access, what do we do? We better do something sure we have access. Anybody ever exploit a box and you, you're in your shell and maybe you get a command or two to work and you're like, yeah, this is it, we're going, we're going. Next command, nothing happens. Why? You lost it, all right? Remember how it works. We're doing memory. We're injecting code into memory. We might not get a good solid point in memory. If we don't, what happens? We lose our shell. So as soon as you get in there, what do you want to do? You want to go plant a, back, a backdoor. Netcat's a fun one. All right? We want to migrate the exploit to another process. What about that one? Huh? Those of you who see my talk tomorrow, remember that. Migrate another uh, process. And what's the explorer process? Uh, your desktop? How many people is going to go kill off their desktop on an average? There you go. You put it on the explorer process, it stays there, it's always there. Depending on your tool and different things, you can set it as persistent, then it's permanently there. You can use a tool Fire Demon. Anybody heard of Fire Demon? Fire Demon convert any process to a service or a program. So you can convert it to a service. So if they ever do shut off or reboot, which nobody does today, right? There it is. It's always active, it's always on. Okay. And then I have plant a keystroke logger, an interpreter. Does it have a keystroke logger? Use priv. Yes, it does have a keystroke logger. So you can have key scan. Start doing your keystroke logger, pretty much anything you want. And interpreter, does it touch the file system? No, it's all in memory. Hmm. Lead in my cheap thing for tomorrow. Memory forensics. You might see a interpreter shell in memory. Anybody ever looked at one in memory? Because that's where everything's at. I was talking to the people at the speed hack yesterday. And they all said, oh, yeah, all my exploits are in memory. Of course, everybody's in memory. We know we're on file system. We've got things that might stop us. Attack mode time, right? Okay? Anybody feel like this yesterday that was in the competition? There's the flag, and all of you were chasing the flag? All right? Exactly. Okay. The database. Like I said, I didn't do any database hacking, but this is the front end. Huh? Everybody's seen the famous SQL injection. This is actually a bank, First National Bank, right? And single quote of one equals one dash dash. What's it going to do if I put it in here in, in the username if SQL injection is prevalent? First user, okay, got a first user. We'll see here in a minute. What, what's this one going to do? <coughs> Empty account, another account. Yep, okay, good. Yep, that's going to do what? Insert, good. And this one? Create a new user. There's that XP command shell that was talked about in the previous talk. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Why in the world do we have command shell capability via SQL? Can anybody answer that question? It's a feature. It's a feature. Uh, Joe comes in and says it's a feature. I can't even understand how it could be or why it would be a feature. All right? Why do you want somebody from SQL to be able to open a shell? But, you know, that's only the one we always talk about. You also know there's registry, stored procedures. That's what we call those stored procedures. There's all these stored procedures within the Microsoft database that you can access once you find the way in. So let's see if we found the way in first. Ah, that's single quote of one equals one. What's that look like to you? It's a database. Trust me, remember, you know, we're, we have to follow the rules. Be careful where you do this. Had a friend of mine do it against his credit union, and guess what happened? About 10 minutes later, he had the entire database for the entire credit union. 
Not going to mention it by name up here, but it's one of the world's largest credit unions. That'll probably tell you an idea who it is. Okay? This stuff works, so be careful when you enter it because you might find something you don't really want to find. So now we have SQL injection in this front end, right? This is the front end application feed in the back end database. That'd be good? Okay? The talk previously was all against the back end database. Well, the front end, who controls the front end? The guy who what? Wrote the code. Huh? I got any programmers? Now it's time to pick on programmers. I'm a programmer, software engineer. Got tired of chasing semicolons at 3 o'clock in the morning, became a software engineer. Right? It was easier. Hand them the code, let them write it, and then you know, the Navy says, oh, we're going to do internet access to ships at sea. Okay, well, you got a degree in computer science, so you're going to make it happen. How'd that have anything to do with internet access? I don't know. Okay? But again, this is a programming error, right? Failure to do what? Sanitize input and use stored parameters. Right? Different things you can do to fix this. All right? But now, once I have the vector, this is my method in, what can I do? Anything that the back end database allows. And there's the actual insert, the actual Fred name in the database. There he is. And there's his credit card number just because that's all I put in there. I didn't feel like typing all that 16 characters or whatever it was. All right? But again, what else could I do? Well, typically, if you've got a credit card database, what's going to be in there? Your limit. So I could go in there and maybe give myself a really nice limit, like, I don't know, 25000 Start small, somewhere around there. Yeah. This is the problem we've got. And as I said in the previous talk, this is epidemic. We, consider, you know, we continue to see this and have seen this for years. This old database that I use here that I'm demoing, probably 2000, we started showing these demonstrations. But why do we still see, if you go to the OWASP, why do you still see SQL injection and injection tax the number one attack? Because people don't write code to make it secure, they write code that looks pretty. Think about it. You got all these people on Wall Street, all these great places, and what do they do? They sit there and write this, and it really oh, it looks really good. It does. It looks really good. Problem is what? The same people are writing the code because they're good at it, but they don't have a clue of stopping these types of attacks. All right? So that's the thing you want to think about. Okay. And there it is, single quote or one equals one. Once we get in, we know we got in. Exact master XP command shell, there it is. Okay? Net user, and we add Fred, Fred PW add, there he is. There's Fred. Okay? And then we just use group, we make him administrator. Did we do anything other than SQL queries? No, this is all SQL. Now, this is what we're getting into. Does anybody still run SQL Server 2000? Yeah? Okay, update, upgrade, right, if you can, but legacy applications, sometimes you can't. United Nations, I worked with the United Nations, they're like, we're running SQL, and then, like, they had all this code that we found all these vulnerabilities in. There's, nobody, there's no funding, there's nobody even knows what the code does, because it's not commented. Come on, my programmers out there, you run into any uncommented code before? Even your own code, maybe two or three months later, try to figure out what it means? Yeah, come on, now we all know we're, we're guilty. Yeah? 